All right, week seven. In week seven, we're going to talk about uh, the link between terrorism and organized crime. Uh, in particular, in my lecture, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on comparison of organized crime groups and terrorism groups. Uh, and then, in a later lecture, we'll discuss, I will discuss um, uh, investigative methods. We'll talk about investigating, responding to organized crime, the material uh, covered in Chapter 14 of, of Mitch Ross' book. <sighs> Before we talk about organized, before we talk about the link between terrorism and organized crime, it is necessary to review uh, the characteristics of organized crime. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to tell you: uh, make sure you watch all of this. There is, uh, I'm planning a surprise, uh, uh, something different at the end uh, that some of you may like. Um, I'm going to try to do something a little different than normal at the end of this lecture. Anyway. Talking about organized crime and terrorism, then let's, let's review the characteristics of organized crime, uh, add to our definition, uh, expand our definition to transnational organized crime. And of course, many organized crime groups are transnational in nature, uh, meaning that they commit offenses in multiple nations, meaning, na meaning their activities, uh, these activities planned by three or more people, uh, are carried out, planned, or controlled, uh, or directed in more than from more than one nation. Uh, understandably, you know, most of our organized crime groups that we talk about, we've talked about this semester, uh, are transnational in nature. Uh, and likewise, most terrorism, terrorist groups, uh, many terrorism groups, are, are transnational in nature. Think back, I want you to think back towards week one when we defined, or, or when we defined organized crime and, and kind of remind yourself of those characteristics common to an organized crime group, uh, things like the hierarchical structure, uh, limited membership, uh, the use of violence and coercion to, to achieve goals, uh, the existence of rules and regulations that govern the behavior of uh, group members, uh, the specialization, those things that make it like a business, such as specialization, and the division of labor uh, within the organization and the urge to, or the desire to create a monopoly. Uh, many of these things you also see in terrorist organizations. Uh, most terrorist organizations have some sort of chain of command, some sort of hierarchical structure uh, where there is so a, pers a single person or a group of people uh, that, that direct the organization who have people who report to them, who, who they command, and then those people in turn pass on commands to others. And I'll talk uh, somewhat a little bit, some a little bit later about uh, the command structure of a terrorist, of a terrorist group. Um, organized crime tends to have, each organized crime group has to have some limitations on membership. I mean, the old school Italian mafia, uh, you, know, you had to be Italian, Italian, you'd be uh, a full blood Italian to join, or uh, groups like, uh, uh, you know, like groups like the Aryan Brotherhood. You, you know, if you're not white, you're not getting in. Uh, the Yakuza, you can be Japanese. Um, you know, likewise, terrorist groups tend to have limited membership. Uh, for instance, Al Qaeda, um, you cannot join unless you are uh, a Muslim and, and, and a true and what they would consider a true believer uh, in Islam. Uh, if you're not this, you're not going to join. You know, both groups use violence and coercion to achieve their goals. Um, both groups use rules and regulations. And, um, you know, there are Al Qaeda has its set of rules and regulations that its members abide by, uh, just like uh, the mafia has Omerta. Um, hold on, I have one of the things I would distribute in on-campus class uh, found online. You can find by googling the Al-Qaeda manual uh, there's a, a chapter two of this uh, Al-Qaeda manual uh, lists the qualifications for becoming a member. When we talk about limited membership and rules and regulations. Think about Omerita. Think about the things you have to be or do to become a member of uh, an, Italian, an Italian mafia group. And then compare it to this. Uh, necessary qualifications for um, Al Qaeda membership uh, must be uh, must be Muslim. Um, you know, cannot uh, you know, 
cannot defend, they say you can't defend Islam if you're not Muslim. Uh, you must be committed to the organization's ideology. You must have uh, some set of maturity so they don't allow uh, people 14 and under to join the organization. You have to be willing to sacrifice, uh, you have to be willing to undergo martyrdom uh, to join. You have to be, uh, be willing to listen to your superiors and, and obey, uh, something they call discipline. Uh, talk about must be uh, keeping secret. You know, talk about keeping secrets and concealing information. Um, you know, the secret should be the secrecy should be used even with the most with, even with the closest people. For deceiving the enemies is not easy. Allah says, even though their plots were such that they such that such as to shake the hills, uh, seek Allah's help in doing your affairs in secrecy. Uh, there's a Quranic verse in here that they. They reference. I'm not sure how they they tie that in there. Um, you know, they you know you use secrecy, uh, conceal information from your loved ones. Uh, you have to be uh, free of illness. Uh, must learn patience. Uh, you know, must uh, be insightful. Uh, and this thing goes on and on. But this the point is there's a uh, a set of rules that govern the behavior of the members, what are the expectations. For the members, just like Omerta has uh, for uh, the members of the Italian Mafia, just like outlaw motorcycle gangs have their uh, chapter bylaws that govern the mem- govern the rules for who can join and what the mem- what behavior is expected of the members afterwards. Uh, we talk about specialization and division of labor. Um, when I talk about uh, you know when I discuss the hierarchy, typical hierarchy of uh, terrorist organizations. You know, we'll see that uh, there certainly is a specialization and division of labor where you know, different people have different tasks within the organization or within each cell uh, so that the cell might accomplish its goals. The big difference, really, and, and, and it's in a lot of ways, uh, the big difference between an organized crime group and a terrorist group are the, are the actual goals. You know, for most organized crime groups, uh, the goals are simple, money and power, um, you know, to get rich. Uh, for a terrorist group, the goal is not money, but it is power. And uh, one, re- one uh, researcher, you know, discussed, he said the goals of, of a terrorist group is all about power. You know, we, you know they, they may claim political and other social goals and religious ideologies but in the end when you get past all of that fluff, all of that uh, language and it all comes down to power the pursuit of power uh, the acquisition of power and then the use of power to achieve some political or religious ideology ideologically based goal um, and so there certainly are similarities you know, terrorist, terrorism and organized crime uh, often looks similar once you get past the why we're doing what we're doing phase. Um, so what is terrorism? We've just, we defined organized crime early in the semester. Uh, so if we're going to compare this to terrorism, uh, compare organized crime to terrorism, we ought to define, I ought to also define terrorism. And I'm going to use a fairly generic, fairly s- simplified definition of terrorism certainly uh, a, a more generic definition than I might use in a terrorism course. And the reason for this is uh, because there are a wide variety of definitions or and explanations for what is terrorism. Um, much like there are many different ways to, to, to say, to answer the question, what is a gang? Uh, there are many, many ways to answer the question, what is terrorism? And if we were, if this was a terrorism course, we would spend uh, we would spend part of a part of a lecture and spend an entire lecture talking about the differences and the common characteristics of different different definitions of terrorism uh, used worldwide. But I don't want to do that here. So I would just give you a def, uh, generic definition. My generic definition of terrorism for you would be that der- def- terrorism is the unlawful use of force for the purpose uh, for the purpose of uh, intimidating or coercion uh, or coercing governments uh, 
with the goal of enacting political change shaped by a political or ideology by some some sort of ideology, whether the ideology political, uh, social, or religious. But again, it's all about maintaining the power to create change. There are uh, we define terrorism. It's necessary to uh, talk about different types of terrorism that exist uh, that happen in the world. And again, this is another one of those. I'm going to give you kind of a generic list. Um, there are at least a dozen different different typologies for terrorism. Um, and again, in a formal terrorism class, we might spend some time looking at, comparing and contrasting uh, different typologies for terrorism to find a best one. Uh, but I'm kind of going to give you a generic, uh, a more generic type. And so for my typology for terrorism, for my generic typology for terrorism, I'll tell you that there are four types of terrorism. Um, and like I said, this is not an inclusive list. It is also not an exclusive list. And, and as you'll guess, some of these, some terrorist groups could fall into more than one of these types. Type one is state terrorism. And this, uh, for this typology, I will define state terrorism as terrorist acts that are committed by a government against its own people. Uh, so, for instance, the use of uh, weapons of mass destruction by Saddam Hussein against the Kurdish people in northern Iraq uh, would be an example of state-sponsored terrorism, or state terrorism. Type 2 would be uh, international terrorism. And for international uh, terrorism, uh, we, would, we call international terrorism a terrorist act that is planned ex and executed across more than one nation state. And so, you know, it may be, uh, we may be talking about a terrorist act that is planned uh, and directed from uh, one nation and that occurs in another. But the goal, but the idea behind a term, but deciding if something is international terrorism is deciding where all the pieces happen. If the pieces of the terrorist act occur in multiple locations, then it is international terrorism rather than uh, our type third type, which is domestic terrorism. Uh, domestic terrorism are terrorist acts that occur, uh, all occur, are planned, um, are directed all within a single nation. Uh, and in that case, we are talking, uh, a good example would be uh, the attack in the Oklahoma City bombing carried out by uh, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. Uh, here is an act committed by uh, American, uh, on American soil, planned on American soil. All of it happened here. And so it is um, domestic terrorism. And then to give you a fourth type, let's call it, let's call it a fourth type religious terrorism. And that is more simply terrorism that is driven by a religious ideology. Uh, and, and don't make the mistake of restricting that just to Islamic terrorism. Um, they consider uh, domestic terrorist acts committed by the Irish Republican Army. Uh, that particular, you know, that could also fall under uh, the category of religious terrorism. Concerning the IRA, uh, the battle between you know the British and the IRA uh, had to do with differences between Catholics and Protestants. So you know, don't just think Muslims when you think religious terrorism. <sighs> Regardless of the type, all uh, terrorist groups have some sort of uh, organizational scheme. They do vary. Uh, you know, they, some of them are, high, are, are, are vertically hierarchical. Uh, some, are, uh, some are very nebulous and kind of a leaderless resistance um, that's organized along uh, various cells that uh, know one or two of each other. Um, and then you uh, sometimes have a central cell. Uh, that controls, or a central group that controls uh, a varied number of cells around it. I think before I get into organization, um, let me do a little bit of comparing. I uh, do a little, a little comparing and contrast between terrorist groups and organized crime. Um, and we've talked a little bit about it. Uh, Todd noted that they both have uh, some sense of organization, which I'll get into more in a minute. 
Um, they tend to have network-like type structures, uh, both temporary and permanent. Uh, they tend to have both. They both tend to have business-like organizational structures, uh, rules and oath. We talked about that. Takes advantage of public corruption. We talked about that. What are the differences? And it is the motivations. Uh, and gee, I talked about that already. Uh, for organized crime, motivation is money and power. While for terrorism, it may be uh, the desire for change for religious, uh, social, or political reasons. Uh, and again, it's just the, the gathering of power. So I guess I will get into structure of organized crime. Uh, since I talked about this stuff already. Uh, we talked about comparing the structure for both organized crime and terrorism. Uh, the complexity of this organizational structure varies by the size of the organization. The larger the group, the more complex uh, the organizational structure needs to be. Uh, for terrorists, specifically, security is even more necessary for survival than it is with organized crime. Understand, you know, and you already know, organized crime groups need to have some semblance of security, uh, some sense of secrecy uh, to protect themselves from law enforcement, and terrorism works the same way. You need some security brought on by secrecy uh, to prevent uh, being stopped by governments. Uh, the way this works with terrorists is normally the leader of an individual cell will not have any knowledge of most of the other cells in the organization. He has very limited knowledge, uh, only has those contacts that he needs to carry out uh, his business. And so you'll find in a terrorist organization usually only the head, only the guy, uh, the one individual or the group of individuals who run the whole uh, group, uh, they're the only ones that have complete knowledge of everybody in the group. And so the only, in the way that comes down to is uh, if you catch a terrorist, you know, the only the only information you give up are those limited contacts that he knows. Um, you know, if you really want to know the breadth and extent of an entire of, of a of a terrorist group, a complete completely, then you've got to catch one of their higher up leaders and, and waterboard him until he tells you everything he knows. Uh, cell sizes themselves can range anywhere from smaller groups of 20 to 50 members to as large as several hundred. For the structure itself, most groups have a uh, command, a single command element, except for a leaderless resistance type. Uh, most groups have uh, a single command element, which is a single individual uh, or group of individuals and their direct advisors that set set policy and direction for the group as a whole. Uh, these are the guys that set forth, uh, the, that create the rules, that decide who can become a member. Uh, these are the folks that decide overall direction and purpose uh, for the organization. Sounds kind of like a boss for Lacosa and Oster, doesn't it? Underneath, uh, in the hierarchy, either beneath the, the command element are several subcommands or cells. And each of these subcommands, you know, depending on the, the, the size of the organization, we could be talking about a few to dozens of subcommands or cells. And each cell will have only a limited knowledge of the other cells. Um, you know, some may, uh, you may have a very horizontal, horizontal communication system where uh, the guy in cell one, his only, con his only real contact is the leader of cell two, and the leader of cell two, his only real contacts are the leaders of cells one and three. The leader of cell three, the only people he really knows about are the leaders of cells two and four. Uh, and so you keep information uh, limited. You keep knowledge uh, restricted. Within each cell, there are typically three subgroups. And each of these subgroups have a specific job. When we talk about specialization, division of labor. I'll say so. When each cell have three group, have tend to have three subgroups. And again, this is a very generic hierarchy. This there there is variation worldwide in this. But this kind of what I'm telling you is going to give you an idea of typical organization for terrorists. These subgroups and each of these subgroups may have limited knowledge of each other. 
And the general idea is these, these little subgroups within each cell, not only do they have limited knowledge of each other, but their only real contact up the ch chain of command will be the guy in charge of the cell itself. So within each cell, you'll have an intelligence section. This is your information gathering group. These are your guys that go out and spy, find weaknesses, find potential targets, uh, collect information on government and law enforcement activities. They're your espionage branch. You'll have a support section. The support section is responsible for uh, communication, for garnering political support for the cell, for um, securing safe houses. Uh, they uh, may get into procuring weapons. Um, they are the logistical arm of the terrorist cell. And then finally you have a tactical unit. And the tactical unit, this, these, are your, these are your actual stereotypical, when people think about terrorists, the tactical unit, these are the guys that actually go out and get it done. Um, these are your, your soldiers, um, and they, their knowledge of the whole group is kind of limited to the support group, uh, who they use for safe houses, and they get their weapons from, they may get their training from, but these are your guys that actually carry out the activity. Um, and then it's, it's interesting for terrorists, and while this, and this should, I want you to go ahead and, and on your own, compare what I've told you to what I've told you in the past about different hierarchies of different terrorist group, organized crime groups, and you'll see a lot of similarity. Um, you know, consider, you know, La Cosa Nostra, you might have a whole bunch of capo regimes, they will all know each other, and then their crews may have specific tasks. Uh, one thing I do find interesting, would, would point out, I found just reading around and trying to find stuff to talk to you about, um, terrorists tend to work on a, on a, on a cycle, as far as, as far as, how they conduct their activities. Um, they'll have a pre-incident phase where they do their planning, uh, where they pick a target, uh, uh, decide how they're going to go about uh, attacking that target. They'll have an initiation phase where they begin the process of working towards attacking that target. They'll do their training. They'll procure their weapons. Uh, they'll get all the preparation done. Then they'll have a climax phase, which is the actual attack. They'll have a post-incident phase, which is you know, when you're recovering from the attack, you know, hiding, making their political announcements, whatever. Uh, they might have an after-action phase, uh, anything they have to do to get away, uh, any kind of assessment. You know, at the after-action phase, they're going to assess uh, the effectiveness of, of, of their attack. They're going to look at what they did right, what they did wrong, what they could do better. And when they identify these, what they did right, what they did wrong, what they did better in the after-action phase, then they go right back to pre-planning and start use building on the lessons they learned uh, to plan their next terrorist activity. Uh, organized crime groups, some of them do the same thing. You know, then in each action, they spend time analyzing the mistakes they made, learning how to do things better. Now, when we talk about terrorists and organized crime working together, I would note for you that this is not a new thing. Um, you know, the, the networking of terrorists and organized crime groups stretches back as far uh, as Pancho Villa um, and, and his Mexican rebels engaging in horse theft or uh, the Russian uh, social terrorist group uh, Narodavanya Vonya, uh, who enlisted criminals uh, in 1874 uh, to help further their needs and uh, to help them uh, plan and, and, and organize and, and conduct their operations uh, in trying to bring out bring about social change in, in Russia. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the Narodavanya Voya, uh, the Narodavanya Voya. Um, uh, led, led by B Bakuni, um, they were one of the early socialist groups uh, that attempted to assassinate the czars and, and overthrow the czars' rule. I really need to get Coke to pay me money. All right. Um, more recent history. Um, you know, in the 1970s, when we talked about Colombian... Uh, you know, crime, uh, organized crime in Colombia. Remember, we talked about uh, the National Liberation Army, the ELN, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC. Um, 
uh, these guys, even uh, when they were revolutionary groups, uh, terrorist groups, they had heavy ties to Hezbollah and other Middle Eastern terrorist groups. But at the same time that they had international ties with other terrorist groups, they also partnered with the Colombian cartels, namely the Kali and the Madeleine. When the Madeleine and the Kali cartels fell, uh, they continued to partner with what was left of the cartels. They partnered with the Mexican DTOs, uh, even partnered with La Cosa Nostra. Um, some of them, but over time, as well you know already, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, um, actually became, uh, some of its fronts, some of its cells, actually just became drug traffickers became DTOs of their own in Colombia and yet continued to maintain ties with Hezbollah in the Middle East, uh, which uh, at the very least uh, facilitated heroin trade out of Afghanistan. Um, other revolutionary groups in Colombia, uh, like FARC, turned to selling drugs uh, to fund their so-called revolutionary movements, and many of them, like FARC, just simply became criminal organizations. And yet, like I said, maintain ties uh, to terrorist groups like Hezbollah. Even more recently, um, the Sunni Taliban, Taliban in Afghanistan uh, and the Shiite groups in Lebanon have both engaged in various uh, drug-related criminal activity uh, to, fund, to fund their organizations despite uh, long-standing rules against uh, sales, sale and production uh, of narcotics. Uh, in Afghanistan and Lebanon. Uh, you know, get to a different part of the world. In Russia, uh, criminal groups uh, exist, include, uh, working in front of as out of Azerbaijan, Dagestan, Chechnya, Armenia, uh, North Ostia, uh, have become, uh, in kind of a twist uh, to the story that I'm telling, uh, these, uh, many of these organized crime groups uh, many of these, excuse me, many of these uh, rebel, rep organized crime groups have actually become political and have made uh, an unusual shift from being criminal groups uh, to having a political agenda and have become terrorists. Uh, to give you kind of a list, uh, I'll give you a list of terrorist groups, the FBI list of the terrorists, I'll give you a top ten terrorist groups that have sizable links to organized crime. Uh, the list would include Hezbollah. Uh, and FARC, too, that I've already talked about. Others include the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, uh, the Kosovo Liberation Army, uh, the Kurdish Workers' Party, which by now you should be very familiar with, uh, the Islamic Movement of Uzbe Uzbekistan, uh, the Provisional IRA, uh, and the, my favorite name, uh, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilaz. In 2003, uh, Shelby gave us, uh, did some research and gave us some specific links between organized crime and terrorism. Uh, these include uh, organized crime activity as a means of supporting, financially supporting terrorist organizations. Uh, this includes terrorist and organized, organized crime groups both operating together in areas where government and law enforcement is weak or there are open borders like, I don't know, United States. Um, you know, both just work together towards money laundering and both use corruption and, and, and same lines of corruption to achieve their goals. And then the final thing uh, that I want to talk about in this lecture are five types of organized crime uh, terror links. Uh, and these include activity appropriation, uh, which is where you have an organized crime group and a terrorist group. Uh, that uses similar methods without actually working together. Uh, their you know, second type is the nexus, uh, which is where uh, each group relies upon the support and expertise uh, of the other. Then you would have uh, the symbiotic, the symbiotic uh, relationship. <clears throat> Excuse me. The symbiotic relationship where uh, groups develop uh, cooperative relationships of mutual benefit or defend dependence. There is the hybrid type, uh, type four. One, two, three, four. Uh, these are where groups share both methods and motives. 
And then finally you have transformation. This is where a terrorist group just abandons its ideological and political motives altogether in favor of criminal objectives uh, or the criminal groups uh, become terrorist groups like what's happened like in Azerbaijan. Um, and so I told you there would be something different at the end of the lecture. Um, you notice it's uh, kind of short for my typical video lecture. And that's because I want to do something different. Rather than me talking about, endlessly talking about different terrorist groups, the different organized crime groups, and their relationships like I did with the PKK a couple weeks ago, um, what I'd rather do is give you an opportunity for some extra credit. And I know um, some of you, you know, were not, uh, maybe not as pleased with your grade on the midterm or are worried about uh, a grade you might get on your term paper. And since there really aren't any other assignments, this is kind of an off week for you. Um, uh, I'd give you a, uh, an opportunity for extra credit. Um, and then this, here it is. For each of these five types of uh, organized crime terrorist links, um, find, find an example. You know, you know look at uh, the different groups that Dr. Roth talks about in his textbook. You know, go to the various internet websites that, that you know, legitimate websites that talk about terrorist groups and our nice crime groups and find, do your best to find me an example of each one and then, you know, just briefly talk about, you know, just give me a little, you know, send me a, send me a, uh, a Word document or a PDF or just send me a document, you know, where you list out each, you know, list these five and, and talk about your example and why you say that was an example. Uh, this can be either, um, you can do this individually, or you can contact through email or through the discussion forum, uh, work with one or more of, of your uh, peers in the class. And so uh, this can be either an individual or a group project. Uh, I'll offer extra credit uh, either way. And as long as if you do it in a group, um, you know, this of course this is an honor system, but if you do this in a group, just make sure every member of the group is participating. You know, so maybe you know, two or three of you can get together and split the list up and then combine the list. Maybe five of you could agree by email and say, okay, each one of us will take one of these types of links and, and, and find and find an example and then combine your efforts. Uh, either any any in any 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 way is fine. It's up to you guys. So this can be a group or an individual project. Um, uh, just get it to me. I really don't want you guys working on this during next week, during the finals week, you know, so get it to me by Monday, you know, the Monday of the last week, uh, Monday next week, and that's fine, but, uh, and I'll put an announcement on the page so you know this is coming. Okay, that's it for this week. Uh, I hope to, hope to see lots of interesting uh, extra credit assignments. Um, it's an opportunity to make up some points that maybe uh, you haven't made, opportunity to improve your grade, so I encourage you to take, take it up. All right, that's it.